Hello, welcome to General Chemistry 2. My name is Daniel, and in this video we're going to start investigating the equilibrium that occurs between different phases of material. In particular, we're going to be looking at the equilibrium that occurs between the liquid phase and its vapor phase. So, as you know, if we leave some kind of liquid just out on a table, it'll slowly and slowly evaporate, even though it's not at its boiling point. And the reason for that is because of an equilibrium between the liquid and its vapor. So we're going to get into the specifics of how we measure that and how that works in this video. We'll also look at what's known as phase diagrams, which show us a, lo a lot of useful information for all the different phases of a system. So first off, let's, look at, um, let's begin looking at the equilibrium that occurs between a liquid and its vapor. So as I sa just said, we know that if we just leave a liquid, let's say water, on a countertop or something, it'll slowly and slowly evaporate. And the reason for that is because some of the molecules in the system have enough um, energy to escape into the gas phase. So that means that they can overcome the intermolecular forces within the liquid and hence escape from the liquid structure into the gaseous phase and then evaporate out into, I guess, the atmosphere or the room or whatever. What we can, what we can see, what we can also realize is that if we take a a cup of hot water versus a cup of cold water, if we keep the hot water warm, it's going to evaporate more quickly. And the reason for that is because at higher temperatures, a greater percentage of molecules have that sufficient energy to escape solution. And we can see that graphically on the bottom of this slide. So here we have some cold temperature on the left and some hotter temperature on the right. And this, these two graphs are just distributions of the kinetic energies of molecules in the system. We see this red line here, we can call that the threshold energy to escape the liquid. And what we see is that when we have the cold temperature, we have a um, high prevalence of molecules on the left side of that line. That means they don't have enough kinetic energy to escape solution. If we increase the temperature to this uh, T2 on the right side, some warmer temperature, we see that the curve has changed quite a bit. We have a significantly higher distribution of molecules um, on the right side, where they have enough kinetic energy to escape. And you can see that based on the fact that the area of these two kind of triangle looking things on the right side increases when we have a hot solution. That's just saying that there's enough kinetic energy um, to escape this solution. Okay, so there's definitely a dependence of the equilibrium point between a liquid and vapor based on the temperature of the system. What we can say is that if the temperature is higher, we're generally going to have a higher um, amount of molecules in the gaseous phase. And now the way we actually measure what's in the gaseous phase versus the liquid phase is through this uh, quantity called vapor pressure. Vapor pressure is just referring to the pressure of a liquid's vapor above the actual liquid phase. So what we can think, I think the easiest thing to think about is we can have a closed system. If we seal off a container of some liquid, um, there's going to be a certain amount of molecules that escape into the gas phase above the liquid. And that's just the vapor pressure, or they exert a vapor pressure. Like any other equilibrium we've talked about with concentration, this is a, um, this is a dynamic equilibrium, meaning that the rate of condensation of molecules is the same as the rate of evaporation. So if we had our system over here, let's say, and we had our liquid, the rate at which molecules escape is going to be the same rate at which gas molecules go back into the liquid phase. And this is our, this is our vapor pressure uh, equilibrium here. And as we can imagine, the equilibrium vapor pressure is going to vary with temperature if for the same reasons that we said in the previous slide. So how do we actually measure vapor pressure? Well, there's a useful way we can illustrate that. So if we look here, let's say on the left side we have some uh, frozen liquid, right? So there's no vapor above it because it's completely frozen. It's a solid. If we melt this liquid and turn it into a liquid in um, section B, we're going to have some of the molecules escaping into the gas phase based on the pressure and um, or the temperature of the system. So what you also see is that on the side of this container we have a 
tube of mercury. You'll find that familiar from when we saw our barometer for just measuring a uh, standard atmospheric pressure. So what we see is that when we, when we melt the solid and therefore have molecules going into the vapor phase, we push this mercury downwards and upwards on the other side. We're pushing it through the tube due to the exerted pressure of the vapor. So we see that ha that causes a change in the relative heights of the mercury on each side of the tube. And we can use that scientific we can use that experimentally to measure what the vapor pressure of a solution is. So this is just happening because vapor pressure is being exerted. Okay, so that's that's pretty similar to what we saw with a barometer in GenChem 1 when we were dealing with um, the ideal gas law. So we already established that vapor pressure and temperature clearly have a relation to one another. And that relation is summarized by this thing called the clausius clapeyron equation. That has the form ln of the pressure, the vapor pressure, is equal to the negative enthalpy of vaporization over RT plus C. So what that means is that we can measure the vapor pressure at varying temperatures and um, generate a curve from this line. And we see that this has the form y equals mx plus b, where on the y-axis we have ln of the vapor pressure, and then the slope would equal negative delta h over r, and then on the x-axis we'd have the inverse of temperature. So let's see what happens if we measure the vapor pressure at different temperatures and graph the results. So we get lines that look like this. On the left side we have H2O, on the right side we have CH4. And we see that this forms a relatively linear line if we map it between ln of the vapor pressure and in the inverse of temperature. And then the slope of each of these lines is simply this uh, negative delta H of vaporization over R. So one thing we can ascertain from this is we can see that the more negative the slope, the higher the enthalpy of vaporization is going to be. And remember that enthalpy of vaporization is just the kilojoules required to convert a mole of this liquid into a gas, or vice versa if you just change the sign. So obviously we can also calculate the enthalpy of vaporization based on measuring the slope. So if we say the slope is equal to, I don't know, negative 2, we would set that negative 2 equal to negative delta H of vaporization over R. We'd plug in R 8.314, and then we could calculate for the enthalpy of vaporization. So using the clausius clapeyron equation is a way that we can calculate the enthalpy of vaporization of a um, substance. And we see that H2O has a higher delta H than CH4 does. So let's, let's look at the numbers that come out for a few different substances. And that's illustrated on this table. So we see that we, ha jet we have boiling points decreasing as we go, uh, sorry, increasing as we go down. And we see that delta H vaporization also generally increases. So that kind of makes sense. If, if, it require, if a substance requires more energy to convert it from a liquid to a gas, we can also assume that's going to imply a higher temperature too. But what is it about the substances that r gives rise to these different boiling points and va vaporization enthalpies? The answer to that is in its intermolecular forces. So let's look at a few of those. Let's say we take argon, methane, uh, ethanol, and then uh, water and mercury. So if you recall from Gen Chem 1, we can assign the dominant intermolecular force for each of these. For argon, that's just a noble gas, so it's London dispersion forces are strongest. Same thing for CH.